All right. Thanks again for for joining today's webinar. Again, my name is Gil, and I'm um, I'm with Metadata. Uh, just a few um, housekeeping items before we start. Uh, this webinar is going to be 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to open up it, open it up for questions in about 35 minutes uh, to Q&A. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so uh, you're going to get an email with the recording of this webinar afterwards as well as any material um, that we're running. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to start typing those into the chat window uh, during or at the, at the Q&A session time. Okay. Well, again, my name is Gil. Uh, I'm the founder of Metadata. And with Metadata, we automate digital marketing for B2B. Uh, our platform pairs together AI and experimentation. And in this webinar, I'm going to give an overview of uh, where the industry is going, uh, kind of the changes in the industry, in the marketing industry, um, and how to use and apply uh, big data and machine learning um, into your day-to-day -day marketing ops. In last webinars, uh, we received quite a bit of um, interest in diving a little bit into our platform and into uh, you know some of the work that, that we've been doing with clients, and so we're, we've updated it uh, just a bit. Again, feel free to uh, to give your feedback or, or ask a particular question that you might be interested in, and we'll be happy to uh, keep evolving that uh, webinar accordingly. So let's just start by um, kind of tackling the, the one of the major um, paradigms that, that we're seeing today, which, which is the account-based marketing. Account-based marketing is becoming uh, a very popular term and a very popular strategy among digital marketeers, especially in B2B. And it's because the, the account-based marketing, if you guys are not familiar with it, it's really the, the, the paradigm of shifting or, if you want, shifting the, the, the marketing and the targeting from spray and pray for kind of marketing to everyone and seeing who sticks to really flipping the funnel and saying there is a, a particular set of companies and a particular set of people within those companies <coughs> that our company can, can sell to. And, and those kind of prospects can actually materialize into commercial business. And usually it's a small percentage of your pipeline. If you look into your, your traditional pipeline, the funnel, you see you know, your total addressable market, you start diving down into particular companies, particular contacts, then you look into the leads, those who actually raise their hands and say they're interested in, interested in, your, in your service or, or your product. Then you dive further into marketing, what we call marketing qualified leads, and you dive even further to sales qualified leads, opportunities, booking, revenue, so on and so forth. Um, that's how a pipeline is usually uh, is usually done. And what happens is you see many unqualified prospects in the pipeline. You will see, you know, students, uh, you know, people who work for companies who are too small for you or too big for you or they don't have budget or it might be a competitor or a consultant. Um, many, many people who are not qualified to be in your pipeline. And that creates two issues. Well, the first one is uh, it gives you a false positive. You think you're generating a pipeline. You think you're generating leads. You think you're generating demand. Well, in fact, what you are really generating, that leads into the second problem, is noise. And that noise you generate is, is costing money and costing time uh, for your organization. Your sales counterpart, their job, the only thing they are measured by is the revenue they're bringing into the company. And if they're basing some of their um, success and some of their strategy on the demand and on the leads that you're generating, if you're bringing in a, a student from overseas or a competitor into the pipeline and you, you, you transfer it to the SDR or the BDR team as a lead, you'll start losing your credibility with the, with the sales organization. And that's something that we see in, in many, many companies. So one of the promises of account-based marketing is really to avoid that and saying, okay, there are 10,000 companies in the U.S. that we can sell to, and there are seven people in each company that our sales cycle usually needs to, uh, to evolve. Let's focus on those 10,000 companies. Um, you know, let's say your sales cycle is, is three months and it's a million dollar ACV, um, and you currently have seven customers or eight customers because you're a big enterprise software company, going after those concentrated 10,000 or even further down, narrowing down to 1,000 companies might be beneficial. And that's why account-based marketing is very successful. So again, 
It's just the narrowing down of the targeting that you do instead of to everyone, to a very particular set of companies and people in those companies. Now, the issue with account-based marketing is that, yes, it's very popular, but also the, the it's a double-edged sword, because now account-based marketing means many things to many different people. In fact, if you do a quick Google search, you'll find many kinds of companies that each kind of claim we are account-based marketing. Um, some of them tackle it from the insight point of view. So the types of, of insight that they give you based on your, um, on your CRM data, based on your marketing automation data, can tell you what type of company you should go after to begin with. There are some companies that help you define the buyer persona. There are some companies that help you actually score your opportunities, uh, give you a penetration percentages. So these are the inside companies. They don't necessarily uh, do anything, but they, they give you a very a set of very interesting insights. They don't take action on, on your behalf, but they give you very important insights in, in order for you to, to build your ABM strategy. Then there, you have the data sources, those companies that sell you data, and you need the data. Um, I'm sure you guys are both very familiar with with the practice of going to a ranking or to an inside view or a zoom info or clearly and purchasing data, saying, hey guys, I need you know, a list of 50,000 companies who are using this technology, or I need a list of 25,000 companies with this revenue from this location, and I need uh, those job titles um, and, and those seniority uh, contacts inside that, in the, inside that list. So those are the companies that help you actually build your data set, your target customer list, your target prospects, so on and so forth. And then you have the, those companies that help you create custom audiences. So it could be a company like Facebook that you can upload a list of, of contacts to. It could be um, a company like Livegrant that helps you translate, uh, you know, contacts into PII, into personally identifiable information like a cookie or an IP address or a mobile device ID. And so there are companies that can sell you data so that you can use that data to send them emails, send them, you know, postal mails, um, show them ads, so on and so forth. Then you also have the Legion companies. Those are companies that are uh, focused on generating net new opt-in leads for you. Um, those are usually advertising technology companies. So you look at companies like a uh, uh, data group or an agile, companies that you can set up a retargeting campaign or, or a display ad campaign or a Facebook ad campaign or Twitter or LinkedIn um, advertising campaign. And so you have many different tools today that you can use in order to apply account based marketing strategy. But the problem is, again, it's a broken process. And the, 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 the two issues with, with the broken process is, first of all, because it's broken, I mean, because it's not connected to one another, and it's not like you have a very clean process of you define the customer profile, then you go into the buyer persona, then you start doing the lead scoring, then you do, you know, generate a list of accounts. There is no um, kind of next, next, next finish kind of process that you can apply in campus marketing. And so because the process is not connected, it's very hard to optimize it. If you're generating a really good pipeline and you want to understand what exactly did you do to generate that piece of pipeline, you can trace it back and understand, okay, I've taken these seven actions, this insight led to this data set, which led to that uh, PII custom audience, and this particular campaign with this combination and creative, so on and so forth. You can try to, to create some, some things using UTM tags, but it's going to be very challenging to really move all the pieces, which will bring you to the second pieces. That there are many solid point solutions. There are many different vendors that you use in order to apply in account-based marketing. So it doesn't sound like you have to just use one tool, but you actually have to use a plethora of tools. You have to use multiple techniques and use multiple uh, software pieces in order to execute an account-based marketing strategy. And the challenge is that you're you want to keep kind of manually use all these tools, connect them, export and import data, and not be able to really orchestrate a process that is scalable. Now, many things that, that are coming into, if you take account-based targeting or account-based advertising as an example, there are some things you can control, um, and there are some things that you cannot control uh, in the process. For example, things that, that you can control is an audience. Things that you can control is the creative. Things that you cannot control is how your advertising campaign is going to be paced, 
how many impressions are going to see your ad right away? Um, how many clicks are you going to get? You don't know it uh, right, right off the bat. How is your um, ad to landing page going to convert? Like, are people going to click on the ad and then they're going to put their, their email or an article in the form? Or are they going to drop in the, in the landing page? Or are they going to maybe not convert to begin with because your creative is not attractive or, or resonate to get a window? Um, or are they going to come to the landing page but the form is too long and they're going to end up skipping that form or only putting their email address? Or are they going to put the wrong email address? So there are many moving pieces in making an account-based marketing using an advertising execution arm successful. So the first thing that we want to concentrate on are the things that we can control. So if you are to execute an account-based marketing uh, tomorrow, we propose that we focus on those things that create the most value. The things that might not give you volume just yet, but these are tactics that we believe will get you the right pipeline according to the ABM strategy, and it will um, be able to fine tune your process, meaning understand exactly what works and what doesn't work, eliminate what doesn't work, and slowly optimize towards a good combination of a strategy that can scale for you. So if it works out for five days, if it works out for, for, for three SQLs, it will work out for 30, and it will work out for 300. So going back to, to what you can control, the first thing we can control is the targeting. As we mentioned, one of the biggest highlights of account-based marketing is the idea of narrowing down your targeting from many people, so essentially anyone, usually you if you just start a job as a, as a demand generation manager, you'll start asking people in your company, hey, who exactly are we targeting? Who is our persona? What kind of company are we, are we going after? Maybe you already did the exercise of you know, building your, your personas. Many companies have names for their personas, so on and so forth. And then you, you usually apply that criteria as is to your different tool that you're using. If you're using, if you're gonna buy data from ranking, you're gonna give them that persona criteria and they're gonna give you back a list and you're gonna pay for that particular list of contacts. If you're going to run a, a sponsored contact campaign on, on LinkedIn, they have criteria. So you'll go and start typing down the criteria that you use. The problem with that is it, 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 it sets a very wide net. Uh, the, the people that might be attracted to your campaign, the people that might be captured um, using that criteria might be too wide of a criteria. You might end up marketing those million people or, or five million people. Well, in fact, as we mentioned before, you may only have 10,000 companies you're going after and maybe five people within each. So really, your target market is 50,000 people, no more. And so targeting and focusing really on only those people that if you do get them, they have the potential to materialize into a booking. Those are the only people that you should focus your marketing on. And so the audience you're after, this is one thing you can 100% control. And if you do a good job narrowing down your audience on the people that you should that you should go, that you should go after to begin with, the benefit is that you can spend a lot more money on those people because if you narrow down your audience from a million people to 10,000 people and you have a million dollar budget, you now essentially have a hundred dollars um, to spend on those people versus a dollar. And, and the, the difference is big. The second thing is, you're going to establish a process and credibility with your sales counterpart in which they're actually going to rely on your work to, to do their sales. They're not going to be only, every salesperson is always going to be a lot, you know, very dependent and can go commander with their own, uh, and that's, that's a good thing. But you want to have, you want to get to a place where you only hand out leads after you already vet them, after you know for a fact that, that the salesperson vetted them. In fact, you can, give the audience before you target them to your sales counterpart and get their approval on each and every one of the company and each and every one of the targets you're going after before even spending a dollar on of your advertising budget or your media budget to actually go and get them. So that is the first piece. And today you can you can generate that audience, you can narrow down that audience you're going after, give you multiple ways. You can base it on your CRM data, on your sales force or Microsoft Dynamics or whatever CRM you have, you can base your target audience based on that data and say, hey, computer, go through my data, go through my historical sales, go through all the customers that I've sold to so far, look at things like 
the total amount of the opportunity, who was involved in those opportunities, what kind of personas, what kind of companies were involved, how long did it take you to close the deal, what was the probability of that deal, was it closed one, was it closed off, so on and so forth, all kinds of signals that are available already, and your sales counterpart already filled in those details in the CRM, and you can tell the computer to essentially go through, analyze that data, tell you new things about those, those people, those companies that you haven't even had in your sales force because third-party data sources had that data, and accumulate that data, analyze it, and tell me, as a marketeer, who should I go after next? So those would be classic lookalikes of your CRM data. That would be a good precision audience that you would like to go after. And the type of categories that you can use to, to build those lists can be a mix between demographics, so the usual you know, size of companies, number of employees, location, groups that belong to, so on and so forth, technology, so competing or adjacent or complementary technologies to you. It could be a list of companies who are in your ideal customer profile but also are using a competing technology. Uh, it could be companies using uh, you know, complementary technology to you, so on and so forth. And of course, there's the buyer intent data. Those are uh, kind of timely uh, prospects, people that you know are currently working for a company who is looking for a current solution. It could be a data source like Bombora, it could be a data source like Tistic, it could be a data source like uh, it could be Google AdWords if you're using that channel. So you have, you can put multiple layers of data to really make sure that each and every lead that you get is going to be a good lead. Of course, always keep a balance to make sure that um, you don't catch too small of an ad either. Because if you only want to advertise to 30 people or 50 people, the chances that those people are currently are there online and you, you have their cookie and you'll catch them while they browse is fairly small. And so you want to make sure that you you cast uh, a net that is wide enough to actually run a campaign, but is uh, small enough to only get you the, the fish you're, you're going after. So presentation marketing, that's the first piece, and that's the one thing you can control, and we highly recommend to focus on that a uh, really long time until, until you reach a very accurate, closed down um, audience that you're 100% sure your sales counterpart will be pleased with. And just a quick uh, show on our platform, it's, this is exactly what we do. We kind of combine multiple um, data sources together at Metadata. We combine all the data sources that we connect to. We're connected to most of the major data sources out there, whether they're demographic, technology, buyer intent, and we add more um, quite often. And those data, source, data sources help us kind of normalize between all of them. Say, hey, yes, we want to get a data set of companies using your competing technology, but we also want to make sure they're in your demographics, and we also want to make sure that you're looking for um, your category, let's say, load balancers in the last three months, so on and so forth. So we can combine those data sources to really build a very accurate audience, a custom audience that you will go after. You can also import a list of companies if you have a list of named accounts, if you have accounts that your sales counterparts are currently um, working on, so on and so forth. We'll cover those tactics later on but you can build any kind of audience um, in order to really reach a, an optimized process there. Let's talk about the second thing. The second thing that you can control is the process. Yes, we talked about creative and landing page and language and types of campaigns. There are many, many moving pieces in a campaign and you can control all of them. Many of them are gonna be surprising. They're gonna be uncontrolled. You're just gonna have to kind of wait and see. And so audience is something that you can 100% control. The second piece that we recommend you focus on and you put effort in, in controlling is what process are you, uh, are you taking in order to make the campaign successful? And we're proposing experimentation. Just like programming has moved from a waterfall process um, to agile development where you get a small chunk of product every week, every two weeks, and you iterate accordingly, Marketing is moving to the same exact process where you have some kind of experiment you're trying to, to run. You have an hypothesis. I think that, you know, it could be something like, I think that uh, running this white paper that talks about this open source technology against a list of people who work for companies who are using that open source technology and belong to my ideal customer profile and running 20 different ads with five different types of creative and on four different channels might be a good experiment. And if we get more than 
50 MQLs for, or you get 50 of those um, very leads to opt in for, for $2,000, then I know that it is a successful experiment. That could be, that could be an experimentation. And so we really recommend that you get into the process of really controlling the experimentation that you, the experiment that you do. So you have an audience that you know for a fact is a good audience. Every person that you're going to get from that audience is a good lead. So that solves you the unqualified lead issue. But you really want to set up a process that takes those different segments that you have built and then starts multiplying them with the channels that you know or think are going to be successful. The types of campaigns that you think are going to be successful. Are you going to be classic landing page campaigns? Maybe you're going to try to apply some lead gen tactics, uh, like a lead gen form on the social uh, social channels. Um, are you going to try just one or, or a few types of creatives? Um, are you going to be more successful running one asset over another or start tying particular assets to particular audiences like we talked about before in the example of the open source? So really look for those companies using that open source technology before you market it to them. Are you going to experiment in the form? And if you have a landing page and you have a form, maybe you want to, to experiment one time just collecting an email, one time collecting you know, a bunch of other details. And so there are many different things that you can change. We, our approach is we don't really know what's going to work better um, than the other, so just experiment. And experiment in a way that you can actually get the details back in a fairly, uh, you know, t timely fashion and then reiterate accordingly. So the kind of things that we are experimenting here at Metadata are those are some of the things that I mentioned. So we would generate hundreds of experiments on your behalf on a monthly basis and let them compete against one another, kind of like, kind of like a, a horse race. We'll tell them, okay, go. And at that moment on, you have 300 campaigns running, each and every one of them with a fairly small budget. And our goal would be to see the Pareto rule. If you're familiar with the Pareto rule, the 2080, we think and we see that 20% of your pipeline of your experiments are generating 80% of your of your pipeline. It's actually, when we look at the number, it's more like 1585, um, and that's what we see as kind of the, the the successful experiments. So many experiments will not take at all. They will not generate any impressions to begin with. They'll generate impressions but not clicks. They'll generate impressions and clicks but no conversions. So general conversions, but not good conversions, because even if the audience is perfect, there are still some um, some fraud, some bot clicks, or people are using their friends or their family members' social media. So you'll you'll get you'll be targeting the father because it's the father's computer, but the son will be getting it. Uh, you'll be, you'll get um, leads that are good, but are way too expensive. And so there are all kinds of um, fail grades to the to the experiment, but there are also many success grades, meaning hey, this combination of this particular white paper with this particular audience, with this message and this creative on this channel, um, on this campaign time is, is working very well. It's been generating leads consistently for a good cost per lead, and we see those leads turn into SQLs. And we actually have the entire picture, right? Because if you do have a good credibility with your sales counterpart, and if your systems are connected to the end result, which is your CRM, if you know that a lead that you have generated as much as matured into a marketing qualified lead, a first qualified lead within three weeks, it's now an opportunity in Salesforce, you know for a fact, without really asking anyone, that this is a good campaign. This is a good experiment that is yielding a pipeline uh, that is converting. And so you want to keep doing whatever you were doing in that particular combination, and of course you want to go to those experiments that haven't yielded and successful ROI, and you want to eliminate those. And then reiterate, reiterate, and then recalibrate your model. Just a quick example, you can see that those uh, who, who are uh, clients and use our platform are generating a very significant amount of, of experiments. And don't forget, they don't have to actually uh, dive into those, right? You don't actually have to go to Facebook and, and start tackling each and every one of them and, and optimize it. The system does it, you know, our, our platform does it for you. It manages all the experiments for you um, and, and allows you to, to kind of quickly understand what's working and what's not and optimize accordingly. So let's talk about some tactics. Um, when you do a content marketing, there are many, many things that you can do, and we wanted to kind of highlight some of the best tactics that we think you should apply according to your situation. So one of the ways to, to start running content marketing is to kind of focus on one particular set of campaigns. Um, let's cover, for example, the air cover. 
Air Cargo is a type of campaign that helps your sales organization essentially give them some support to the outbound efforts that they have. So if you have, let's say you have a team of um, six SDRs and BDRs, you know, three of them do inbound, three of them do outbound, and you have a team of five salespeople, each and every one of them has a different territory in the U.S. And they're emailing people and they're calling people uh, all the time. That's a job, right? You can help them by covering those people that they're already talking to, already emailing, by starting to show display advertisements to those particular people. So if you already know that this month you're going to call these thousand people, why not show them ads, at least to some of them that you are able to catch, before you actually make, make the phone call? And today you can do that. You can apply a list of cookies or a list of people into a programmatic uh, display, ad, display advertising network, and you can tell that network, whenever you see that person, it doesn't matter what website it is, whether you see them in ESPN watching a game, reading their email on Gmail, are they on Facebook, it doesn't matter. You are able to match and serve them an ad. And if you're going to call them tomorrow, you might as well show them an ad of the company a few times. Maybe you'll get lucky and they'll actually see the ad. Maybe you'll get even luckier and they'll click on the ad or click on the ad and, of course, convert and come in as an email feed. But they, the, the, even the capability of just serving them the ad and having them see it subconsciously and then following up with a phone call is beneficial and it's proven to give you a higher uh, response rate just because you're top of mind. Very, very simple concept. So that's, for example, just one of the tactics you can apply with the Congress marketing. Another one could be top, top of the funnel lookalikes. Let's say you're running a webinar, just like the webinar we're running right now. And let's say I'm bringing a large customer of mine to join me on my webinar. And I want to make sure that we're squeezing the value on, on that appearance of this client. I don't want to have a webinar with, with three attendees uh, bringing one of my largest customers and, and only using that, that, uh, that small audience for, for his appearance or her appearance. And so what I'd like to do is guarantee a list of engaged, qualified attendees. How do I do that? Let's say I generated 40 uh, registrants so far and I have two weeks left. I can take those 40 leads, I can run them through a machine and realize metadata or separately go to many different data sources and, and ask them for, for that result and generate a set of lookalikes, people that are not yet in the registrant list, but they resemble those 40 people who registered and you can start running ads against those people with that webinar invitation. So people who look just like those 40 people who already registered, let's say 10,000 people like that, will start seeing the ad. Some of them will see the ad, will click, will register, and you start <coughs> building up a much bigger list who, that resembles your core registrant list. And you can guarantee you that you will have 100, 200, 500, as many registrants that you want. Of course, you'll have to um, have an ad budget that corresponds to that goal. One more example would be um, pipeline acceleration. So many of you have you know, a list of main accounts, a list of companies that you're, that you're going after, and maybe you already started some opportunities with them. But the nature of opportunities is some of them, you know, they, they accelerate fast and they progress, and some of them get stuck. And so for those opportunities that are in the limbo, what they call limbo, it's neither a closed one nor a closed loss. Those opportunities are the worst because essentially they're not, they're, they're making make it very hard to predict what your process is going to look like. And they are, every, every day that they're not getting towards a resolution, either a closed loss, talk to me in three months, or not interested, don't have the budget, or a closed one, okay, let's sign a contract. They are getting closer to, to becoming zombie opportunities. And so you want to accelerate, accelerate those, uh, those opportunities. Of course, you want to accelerate them to a close one as much as possible, but anything would be, would be better than limbo. And so one of the tactics would be to take uh, those particular personas, those particular people who are involved in that buying decision, and those particular companies that are currently in your pipeline, and start running ads against those people. Granted, you will not run the same ad against those people that you would have run um, air cover or, or, or look like because you, you want to run middle or bottom of the funnel offers to those particular people. If you have a, a, if you have, let's say, two buyers 
within a Fortune 1000 company, which is currently in a limbo, and you haven't heard from them for a month, and you want to kind of quote to quote wake them up, you don't want to wake them up with uh, a top of the funnel collateral that's like that talks about your company as if they never heard about it. They already heard about it. They probably already saw your pricing. They may be comparing you to your competitors. They might be thinking uh, whether they should do a deal with you or not, if you're negotiable, so on and so forth. So maybe they are somewhere in the process. You want to hit them with an offer that resonates with that particular um, stage. So maybe give them a case study. If they're comparing you to others, give them an idea of what kind of results you should be getting from them. If you're, if you're in the pricing uh, negotiation stage, maybe offer them a promotion. Um, <clears throat> so there are all kinds of different, uh, you know, total cost of ownership, all kinds of different assets that might be better fit according to the stage of, um, of your prospect. And we just recommend to have the, the capacity to do some type of acceleration to help your salespeople not only generate net new deals, but also help them move those current deals that they already have in the pipeline, move it forward. Certainly there'll be very, uh, there'll be a lot of gratitude if you help a sales, salesperson close the deal, not only get that deal to begin with, to get that lead, get that opportunity on the table, but actually closing that deal that will make you um, equate the deal with the salesperson very high. So now to, to cover again what, we, what we've gone through, you know, we talked about integrating, putting all your marketing technologies together into one, so connecting your CRM, connecting your marketing automation, connecting your Facebook ad account, Google ad account, Twitter ad account, LinkedIn ad account, connecting your data sources, putting all together into one piece so that it talks to one another. That's the, the connected process we were talking about. Then scaling that process, understanding exactly, okay, now that I have all these, these pieces in one, more machinery, I'm going to start running experiments and understand exactly what works, what doesn't work, identify the bottlenecks. Once, once, once you start running those hundreds of experiments, you'll quickly, quickly find out, find out things like, hey, my landing page is, is bringing lots of traffic, but it's not converting at all. So maybe I have a problem with my landing page. My form is attracting lots of visitors, but actually only one out of 20 um, puts their details. Maybe I should shorten that form and put just an email there, and maybe I should and reach the rest using a data source API, and so on and so forth. Um, so really tuning and integrating is, is the biggest stage because that's where you set up and understand exactly what kind of machinery even works for you. Then once you start understanding, okay, you start having a few wins, you start thinking about your combinations that work for you and you can generate pipeline uh, somewhat predictably for you. Then you want to start scaling it up, saying, okay, you spent $1,000 and you generated 20 leads. Now, does it mean that if you spend 10,000, you're going to have 200. Does it mean that uh, you can start adjusting and putting new different campaigns into the into your your process, and so it will automatically work out for new types of collateral? Is a webinar asset going to work the same way as a, as a white paper asset in the same combination of audience, channel, uh, so on and so forth? So you want to quickly move into uh, into scaling and adjusting and optimizing your your experimentation in a way that resonates with your pipeline goals. Then let's just go through the, the process from a bird's, bird's eye view again. So the kind of work that we do here at Metadata is really dive into the, the, the inside of, of your business to really understand, based on your CRM data, who it is that you have sold so successfully in the past. So you always want to start there, the information that you already have in place, and make many data-driven decisions and, the, you know, as little as possible hunch-based decisions. And so you're going to pull data from your CRM. We're going to enrich all that data. So we're connected to all the major data sources out there. So every time we see an email, every time we see a domain name, we can see all the technologies that are working on that domain. Uh, Front-end and back-end. Are they using uh, Apache Cassandra? Are they using Hadoop? Are they using Cloudera? Are they using AWS or Azure? Are they using Optimizely or are they using Unbound? Uh, what kind of tools um, are, have they looked in the past three months for uh, product management solution, are they, are they looking for an infrastructure solution? So really you can find out a lot of information just by having uh, your prospect's email or having your prospect's domain. You can find out, you know, hundreds of different signals about the people, their education, their age, estimated salary, budget, uh, power, so on and so forth. And you use that information to do some profiling. So you want to say, okay, based on your past 100 customers, these are the three types of companies you should go after. They are in this location, this is this size, 
uh, the range of their employee size, the revenue, the location, and the people that you that you sell to, they belong to these groups, have these skill sets, their education, their gender, their age, their location, um, so on and so forth. You can really come up with many, many different signals for the persona as well as for the company. And you want to use those signals to start building those uh, those audiences. So you want to start building those, um, you know, campaigns on social, on programmatic, on different uh, networks that will allow you to start running ads against those people. And of course, because you're connected to the marketing automation, because you're connected to the CRM, every lead that comes through will get, get into your machinery. And every lead that will come through will get a match to the ICP that you've generated before in this stage. So you'll know, okay, is this lead close to what I was going after? Uh, is this in the list of, of accounts I was going after? Um, you can pull data from the CRM and see, is an opportunity now created with that particular account? Um, you're going to find out all of, all those details by having this clo closed loop approach and making sure that indeed that uh, that particular experiment works well, and you can recalibrate the model accordingly. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. Um, I already saw a bunch of questions in the in the Q and A chat. Um, I encourage you guys right now to uh, to type any questions that you may have uh, on ABM in particular. Uh, or just in general about experimentation, uh, agile marketing, or using ML and statistics to, uh, and to apply that to your marketing. All right. Um, we've got the first one here. Um, just asking, how does this strategy differ from A-B testing? Yes, of course. So that's a great question. So A-B testing, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, is just the practice of trying out two, two different uh, options and seeing which one does better, and of course then going with the one that did better, a very, very well-known uh, practice. So example for it would be with email campaign, you're going to send an email, and you're going to try two different subjects to that particular email. You're going to take 20% of your, of your um, email recipients, and you're going to send them, 10% of them are going to get one subject, the other one, the other 10% is going to get another subject. I'm going to give it a few hours, see which subjects perform better. For example, had a, had a higher open rate, which is a good metric you can base your testing on for, a particular, for this particular example. And then whoever got a higher open rate is going to use that particular subject for the rest of the 80% uh, prospect. So that's kind of the example of A-B testing. And the question is, how is that different than the experimentation we talked about before? And the difference is multivariant experimentation versus A-B testing. So, a-B testing takes one particular variable and tests it against one another. So you have two options. You have um, one variable, two options, and you have a very clear answer uh, because there's one match result to it. With multivariate experimentation, multivariate experimentation is a little different. You have many, many moving pieces, and you also have many results that might lead to a successful outcome or not. And so you want to really generate as many possible um, experiments within that realm of, of, of options, of possibilities. You don't only want to try, and, and I would say it's probably very hard, and maybe that's where the question comes from, it's very hard to test 150 different experiments or 150 different variations. And that's why you want to let a computer do that for you. Uh, and so a, a team of growth marketeers might be able to tackle within, within themselves 10 different experiments per month, you know, different channels and different audiences and different um, creative and different tests and different campaign types, you can generate 10, 15, 20 experiments and, and you are still able to control it uh, manually. However, if you want to go get to the next level and really experiment and understand everything about your process, you need to do multi multivariate experimentation and really try out variations of every possible factor that you're testing. If it's the channel, you want to, you want to try as many channels as possible because many, many there are low hanging fruits. Or if, if you have some problem in your, in your experimentation or in your flow, you don't want to put, to think that the error is not where it's actually uh, residing. For example, you might have an issue with your landing page, uh, but because you're only running maybe two channels and you're not even experimenting with your landing page, you might think that the problem is somewhere else because the landing page will appear uh, in a different manner of a, on a different channel. So the, the ability to do the multivariant experimentation really opens up the entire uh, realm for you where you can see, like a matrix, 
you can identify, okay, I have an issue, I have a bottleneck here on this particular landing pages with this particular channel, I have an issue here with this particular asset on this channel, and I have an issue with this text, this text is not working, uh, or this combination of text and, and creative as, as well as are perfectly fast. And so multivariant experimentation is uh, it's kind of the advanced version of, of A-B testing, and it's what allows you to identify all the possible um, combinations that 15, 85% rule were discussing before. Okay, great. Um, got another question here, and um, how much should I budget to, to do the experimentation? That's a great question. So we usually, um, it kind of depends on, on your, you know, on your overall budget, uh, but we usually allow for at least 20, 30 percent of the budget for experimentation um, because it really allows us to reach an optimized uh, process later on. Uh, in the beginning, usually when we onboard a new client, we usually recommend for, you know, anything between five to eight thousand dollars of, of spend. And in, the, in you know, per month for the first uh, for the first few months, and that really allows you to. And that, that experimentation doesn't mean that you're not going to get anything out of it, right? You're actually going to get you're going to get pipelines from that experiment, from those experiments. But by definition, you should you should look at those as experiments and not as production level campaigns. Meaning, let's say you run 200 campaigns out of those or 200 experiments out of those 17 were successful. Even for those uh, 190, 183 experiments that were not successful, they are going to generate leads. In fact, they might, or they are likely to generate better leads than the ones you've generated so far because you put so much thought into it because the, the, the audience is already very precise, so on and so forth. But for the sake of the process, we recommend that you look at it from an experimentation point of view. Therefore, any result that you get is kind of a, you know, a bonus. While what you're really after is reaching that quote unquote perfect combination in a in two months time or so. Or you're saying, okay, I've already ran three hundred experiments every month for the last two months. I know for a fact that these forty combinations, this particular asset with this particular audience, a Legion campaign on Facebook, using this image and this this particular text above it, it it's yielding the best lead I've ever had for a cost lead that is affordable for me and my sales counterpart is happy. With, with vast majority of the leads that, gener that this particular experiment is generated. When you reach that conclusion, that's something that you can scale up and down, that's something that you can rely on for your pipeline goals. And so you want to get to the place where you have that particular pipeline creation, and that's really the goal for you. Every um, result that you get from the experimentation, and you should, you should just assume 20, 30 percent uh, for that goal is, is kind of a bonus. All right, thanks, Gil. Um, I think we've got time for one more question here. So, um, someone's asking, what is the difference between multivariate and multivariant? Are they just synonyms? Yes, as far as I'm concerned, they are. I've, I've been looking at it. It's a great question and it's uh, something I've, I've Googled multiple times. I think it's, uh, it's exactly the same thing. Um, in fact, if you right click on multivariant and multivariate, it will interchange. All right, thanks so much. Um, I think we are hitting our 45 minute mark. Um, so I uh, should wrap up for everybody who is on, uh, you know, who was able to join us late or if you, you know, need to share this with your colleagues, we'll be sending out a recording uh, after the event. So uh, you'll get that in your inbox. Fantastic. Thank you, Nate, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. It was my pleasure to uh, to discuss combat marketing together with you. Uh, we're available for any questions, whether you're a client or not. We're happy to uh, to kind of set up this new paradigm into the marketing and put a little bit more science behind it. Um, you can email me with any questions. If we haven't been able to uh, to cover your questions, I noticed there were a few unanswered questions, so happy to uh, to answer them uh, one on one as well as in the next webinar. Thanks again for joining us today, and looking forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Have a good day. Thank you.